So Dino Stamatopoulos, thank you so much for joining us on the Burning Castle podcast. And it's great to have you here. Um, I like, I assume many of my listeners, I'm a huge fan of comedy and find it to be so vital today, um, especially as kind of the walls are closing in, in terms of what we're allowed to talk about, allowed to say and not say. And comedy feels like one of the last bastions of Parts.com puts more renters in new homes than yeah, any other website. By sniffing out more listings than anybody it's else. So, I hear them. Parts.com puts See, this is comedy. <laughs> so you know what? Fuck it. Let's leave it in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, let let's just jump into you know, give people a sense of who you are, what you've done. I could I could give the background, but I feel like it'll be better coming from you. Uh, yeah, well, I, uh, I started uh, back in Chicago writing comedy. It, uh, it's obviously a, a comedy improv town, um, but I didn't really know it at the time when I was a kid. I, I just, uh, I was very into, um, you know, Woody Allen and Monty Python and the Marx Brothers and, uh, uh, probably a product of just being uh, a dopey kid who got bullied a lot. Um, but, uh, and then uh, I started, uh, I went to Columbia College in Chicago and they had a comedy writing class and uh, weekly shows. So I would write sketches for that and um, met Andy Dick there and we uh, formed a two man group and uh, eventually moved to LA where I, uh, I got uh, writing jobs on, uh, on the Ben Stiller show and then um, moved to New York and, and was on uh, the first couple seasons of Conan and did a lot of uh, sketch and uh, talk shows for a while and then, uh, then created my own uh, animated shows for Adult Swim and uh, one on Fox. And, uh, yeah. and so I've been uh, pretty lucky with, uh, you know, just working on shows, a lot of shows that just started. I'm, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'm kind of spoiled that way. I like starting shows. I don't like going into shows that have been established already. Um, well, in terms of the, the latter kind, you did a spell on uh, SNL, if I got, if I... I didn't really, you know, I have an IMDB credit for that because I, um, Robert Smigel, uh, wrote a lot of cartoons and he'd, he'd, uh, he'd throw some ideas at me and I'd throw some ideas back at him. And if one of my jokes got in, he gave me a credit on the <laughs> show. Um, so nice. I, you know, I, I didn't never showed up to SNL and worked there, no. But you did do, um, you, you did a character on Community, which- uh, <laughs> did, Yeah, that, that I showed up to, just barely. Pretty uh, hilarious character. Um, if anyone hasn't seen it, it's an awesome show to watch. And uh, Dino's character is just hilarious to look at. Like you just watch, look at the, the star sideburns, yeah. starburns. I'm pretty much just a prop, you know. Right. <laughs> so, um, you know, comedy, comedy is a, one of these weird things, like a bit like writing, which is what I do, which is often feels like, I imagine, a thankless job. I mean, in, in writing, it's not, no one's coming out, out to hand you trays of money and, uh, to, you know, maybe in comedy, you get more applause than in writing, but I imagine it's, it's not the easiest gig to do to, it's not the easiest choice of career. Um, but you know, people love it and they go into it and they don't leave it. What was it for you that kept you in, in it and that keeps you in it still today? Well, I mean, I fell into it really. I mean, I, 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 I've always written, um, uh, you know, I've always written comedy. And um, when it came time to, um, you know, to be honest, when uh, with the Ben Stiller show, uh, Andy Dick first got the acting gig on that, and we weren't really getting along that well. It's hard to get along with Andy uh, a lot of the time. And, um, and I, I was resistant in submitting anything, but uh, finally I did. And I had a lot of material saved up over the years and uh, they ended up liking it. And so I did that. And then after the Ben Stiller show, I was once again, sort of uh, 
dabbling with the idea of not going back into comedy and uh, um, and just uh, maybe you know uh, traveling a little bit. And uh, but then I, I I I read about Conan getting the job on uh, uh, on late night. And I got excited about it and I wrote him a bunch of ideas and I said, here, you can take these ideas. I don't need to be hired. I don't necessarily want to be hired, but you could just take these ideas and, and, and use them if you want. And they, uh, they, they loved the ideas and wanted to hire me. And I said, well, all right, I, I haven't been to New York yet. That'll be a, a fun experiment. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think I've just been going with, you know, what, the fun was, you know, I, uh, I just followed the fun and, uh, I've been lucky enough to, um, to be rewarded by doing that. And working for Conan and writing for the show was a fun experience. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was, uh, you know, it was the beginning. I was a big Letterman fan and I was a little mm -hmm. concerned after he left, well, who's going to take over for him? And then I read a lot about Conan and I thought, okay, this guy's got a very different sense of humor, but I also like his sense of humor. So it was exciting to go there and be a part of that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and Conan is a, you know, is a much funnier guy off camera than he is on camera. If you can believe mm. that. Wow. Just, a lot of times he would just come in and stop us from writing and just do bits for us in the, wow. yeah, in the That's office. Amazing. I mean, I've heard, I've heard the stories about Conan just being this like preternatural comedic talent, just a crazy level. Um, and it comes through in his energy. Like even when he, when the stuff feels a bit dry, like his presentation is just funny. Like what he's saying is not necessarily funny, but he's just <coughs> standing there. There's just a funny energy about it. Yeah, yeah. So- Yeah, he, yes, go ahead, sorry. So after after Conan, what, what came next for you? Uh, so after Conan, once that got established, I quit because uh, it started being less fun. You know, it was um, part of the excitement with starting Conan was uh, actually the first show was really exciting. You know, we built up months and months and months and wrote this sh show and it went pretty well. And then you, you realize, oh, it's every day now right. for the rest of until you either quit or the show's canceled. Mm -hmm. And the first year, you know, we didn't know every 13 weeks we could have been canceled. So it was still exciting for me. Uh, after a year, he pretty much settled in and uh, the network liked him and there was no fear of getting canceled anymore. So when the fear goes away, the fun goes away for me. So mm. I, uh, I decided to, um, to just stop and maybe write something on my own. And then very soon after that, um, I can't remember the order. I might have gone to Letterman uh, just because I was a huge Letterman fan mm -hmm. and they were looking for Conan writers uh, to go on there. And I wasn't that excited because I, I, you know, the show was an older show and it was already established and I didn't know how much I'd uh, I'd be able to to give to that show mm -hmm. um and it turned out not that much really and so <laughs> I went to that show and 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 stayed for 13 weeks and then decided to move on from that and then the, uh, and then I think the Dana Carvey show started mm -hmm. um after that um and that was very exciting because uh once again it was a bunch of great writers and um, a show that we didn't know what it was yet. And it turned out we probably never knew what it was and it got canceled very quickly. Right. <laughs> yeah. But another great, I mean, it's just his comedy's amazing. And especially, I imagine at that time when he was sort of like really at the peak of what he was doing, it was just yeah, an amazing experience to be with someone like that. Well, yeah. And, you know, I was also working with Louis C.K. and Charlie Kaufman, mm. met Charlie Kaufman there. Um, Kaufman Steve, was, a, was a writer on the show. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Stephen Colbert, uh, uh, Steve Carell, 
uh, all all writers or were they were performing as well they were writer performers those guys mm -hmm. and um and then robert smigel of course wow and um so it was a, a crazy group of people so you know that that kind of um that really makes me want to understand and i think people as well want to understand what it's like you know what does it really mean people hear the word writer for for these big shows and this is really a disconnect with what that what that day to day feels like. You know, we imagine like we all we know what it's like to for us to go to a job, but I imagine yeah. it's a really different thing than that. Uh, hours and energy and what you're actually doing. Um, can you just give us like a little glimpse into that into that world? Yeah, and once again, I was very lucky because I was I was going into shows where the writers were given a lot of freedom and a lot of respect and they got to uh, oversee their own sketches mm -hmm. and almost direct them and, and go and direct them and be there. Um, but, you know, first it was like just a general uh, meeting of what the show is. That's when a, a show first starts. And then we just throw around ideas and uh, there's no bad thing you could say, just throw in any idea and what's funny sticks. And another uh, reason I was very lucky is that usually anything that was funny got into a show, especially like on a show like Mr. Show. Uh, anything that made us laugh, we had to, we figured out how to actually make a sketch and out of it and put it on TV. Um, but yeah, you start out with general ideas, and you know whoever the head writer is. If he likes an idea, he'll say, go ahead and write that, or you, you two guys go write it. And, uh, and then we go write it and bring it back and read it at a, a read through or the, the head writer will read it on his own and make changes there, or we'll have a room where we all sit around and punch it up, something mm -hmm. like that. So those moments where you decided to, to stop doing a show, um, you know, that's, that's another thing that I think people love to understand how that works, because you're in a show that's doing well, like Conan's um, or Letterman, and you're saying, I'm sure there's the money is probably decent, and there's a level of stability, and you know, there's sort of a career track, a sort of a, a trajectory there. And to say, you know what, uh, this is not really doing it for me, I'm just going to walk, like, how, how does that work for you on almost an emotional level to say, I'm going to take this risk just because it's not working out for me personally? I think a lot of people would just say, you know what, I'm going to put that feeling away and just stick it out because it's kind of on paper looking good. Well, you know, it's just the kind of person I've always been. I've, I've I always quit a job before I had another one lined up. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's that admirable. <laughs> you know, it's mostly I'm a big baby and I'm like, I don't, I'm bored, you know, mm -hmm. and even with my own shows that I have started, you know, I have had a network pick up my show and by third season, I've completely changed it and to their chagrin and they, they cancel it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I get bored easy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I, you know, I, I also don't like, I'm not uh, attracted to stability in any kind of way. Yeah. Uh, more so in my old age now, mm. you know. Uh, but still, I would not take a job on a writing staff uh, on an already established show, even if I needed the money. I think I'd be miserable there. But that you know, that's still there's there's something about it that's almost in a backhand way. Uh, it's not, I wouldn't say responsible, but it's like you're willing to accept the cost of what that means to walk. Yeah, to, you know. Well, and I also, you know, a more admirable thing about it, you know, uh, you know, I'm not completely humble, uh, is that I know I'm not going to do the show any good by staying there. You know, right. I, I, I actually, it's not even on my IMDb. I was on the Jimmy Kimmel show for maybe a month and did not gel with what the, sh what the show was mm -hmm. and um you know pretty much asked to leave early you mm -hmm. know because i i just didn't feel like i was contributing anything right um 
just to zoom out a bit and to look at comedy today, because it, it's in such a weird place. And maybe it's always sort of like this, or maybe people are just pushing boundaries in way that, ways that they haven't before. But, you know, when you look at what's happened with Louis C.K., what's going on with Dave Chappelle right now, mm -hmm. uh, Sarah, Sarah Silverman's show being canceled, um, it, almost we could just go on and on about with these different examples. It's a really strange thing because we're like negotiating the boundaries of comedy politically today, especially with yeah. Chappelle right now. I mean, this is like breaking every single day. What can he say? Or can't he say? What should he have said? Should he apologize? Can he go to, you know, the Netflix people are walking out the office like what, where, what does this mean to you as a comedian comedy writer that we're in this place where politics has infected comedy? Do you think it's just always been this way and we've we were just more polite about it or is this actually a new thing that we're seeing in the world well i, th I definitely think social media has a lot to do with it there's a lot more uh, power and voices in social media and it's it's scaring a lot of the networks of the big companies um uh so it's not just people who are uh who get to say well i if i don't like that comedy i'm just not going to watch it it's mm -hmm. I don't like that comedy. I'm going to get that guy fired, you know, which is a, it's a different thing than it has been. Of course, it has happened with, uh, it's happening now with the left more, but it, it was happening before social media with the right and, um, you know, and censorship and, uh, you know, the idea that um, if someone was offensive on, TV or radio, like Howard Stern, the uh, advertisers would pull out. So right. that was a form of cancel culture, if you want to use that word too. So I guess it, it has always been happening, but not as much with the, the liberal side, right. you know, right. and, um, and that's fascinating. And I've been thinking a lot about it lately. You know, I saw Chappelle's show and you know, I was offended that it wasn't funny at all. I didn't <laughs> smile, let alone laugh. Yeah. You know, I think he was just doing a TED talk. And I'm like, yeah. okay, but don't call it comedy. Don't call it your comedy show. Right. Um, and I'm not, obviously I'm not as sensitive about the, the, the trans sexual issue because I'm not. And um, uh, so I didn't see anything that offensive, but I'm not, I'm not one to, say if it's offensive or not really yeah. you know um uh and you know i've been watching a lot of uh, like old interviews i saw one with george carlin and he was talking about mm -hmm. andrew dice clay and mm -hmm. uh basically the idea the new term is punching down now but right. going after the underdog and uh, i do i do agree that andrew dice clay you know made fun of women and gays a lot and you know and Chappelle is doing that too he's also black and also you know a minority and that had a lot to do with his last TED talk as I like to call it mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that was his big issue that I'm you know I'm in a in a in a minority that's more downtrodden than yours I look I, I can't have uh an opinion on this, you know, because I'm, I'm a, a straight white man, straight-ish. <laughs> straight enough. <laughs> straight enough for now. <laughs> to get around. Um, yeah, I, I think that's, I think that with Chappelle, I think that's a lot of the point is like, you know, that was polemics, what he was doing in that show is really, for what it was, it was good. He was making his point again and again and again yeah. and again, and he was like driving it home. Um, but at some point it just, it becomes tiring. You know, as an audience member, you're just like, all right, man, just kind of uh, let's lighten the mood here a little bit and stay, you know, I feel like it's, there's got to be a bit of a dance with the politics and touching the hot button issues, which comedians tend to not shy away from. But when you just yeah. dive into that stuff and that's all it becomes, it becomes heavy handed and it feels like that's where Chappelle's going. Yeah, it's very heavy handed. I mean, if he was funny, there'd be a, that'd be a different story and maybe he could make an argument which was i'm just being funny but right. he wasn't he wasn't being funny you know right right and that's what i was that's kind of what i was saying to a friend today it's kind of like yeah. Chappelle seems to want to have it both ways and uh that seems to right. be the problem it's like be funny be offensive great 
and uh, everyone's happy or go and lecture lecture your audience and do that just choose but yeah, he, has, um, he, has, he has an arrogance now that's not uh it's not conducive to comedy mm. you know? um and uh, what you know that's an interesting point actually why why is arrogance not conducive to comedy and why why do you feel like that that's the case uh i feel like a lot of humor is you know based on making fun of arrogance you know and uh, um it's he's become what the straight man is you know someone that you want to make fun of more than you know he's not making fun of himself he's an arrogant guy making fun of you know I don't like the term punching down, but I guess it applies, you know? Um, he, he is going after the underdog. And to him, everyone's the underdog because he's calling himself, you know, the greatest ever. Right. You know? The greatest ever, right, which he actually says on the show, uh, he calls himself yeah. the, goat, the goat. And he yeah. also he's also really driving home the idea that he's a victim, uh, the world's biggest victim. You know, the guy who had had to walk away from $50 million. He had no choice. Yeah, the goat can't be the victim. It's, <laughs> right. it's, it's impossible. Right. And that's uh, that's that that classic model of, of this drama triangle where they're, you know, you're casting everyone in these roles of villain, victim and hero. You're, yeah. and, and you are sort of shuffling between these different roles yourself as, you know, the hero of comedy, the victim of society, the villain of all these other people or blaming other people as the villain who are victimized. It, it just becomes a bit of a mess. Um, but you know who who do you look back at when you look at at the history, even present day comedy of people who really managed to to have that to have that dance and to keep the dance going in a way that was funny and light and still relevant? Are there standouts for you? Uh, yeah, I mean, right right now it's almost cliche to talk about Norm Macdonald, but right. I, I feel like you know he's a, he was a a fairly conservative guy, yep. but it was never offensive you know he right. always tried to look at the issue and make it funny and that was his main mm -hmm. main goal was to be funny you know and uh you know Richard Pryor I feel mm. has always done it uh you know George Carlin definitely had moments where he uh uh he got a little preachy but mm -hmm. yeah. uh it was it was preachiness that I agreed with at the time <laughs> you know um and you know i have to say that the you know he's a friend of mine uh and still is uh louis ck mm -hmm. uh is is doing some great comedy which is about now and about these very issues and i i think mm -hmm. he has like, some solid points about it yeah i mean he's he's awesome he was just one of one of the greatest it still is i think even though he's you know it's changed for him and what what he's doing how he's doing it has changed but you know that also kind of brings up the question of like you've got this real mainstream of comedy that's coming out through uh the big media and netflix and, and H hbo people getting their specials and stuff and then when that is no longer an option like like it sort of has been for louis ck um where do people go and what do they do? And like, how do, how do you, what is the independent media equivalent of comedy today? Um, well, you know, the internet, Louis has his own website, mm -hmm. uh, does it there. I think he's uh, supporting other people who are, are also um, uh, going through similar things. Um, I think if you're a standup, uh, you have, uh, a leg up on all of that because you're all uh, if you're a good stand-up you're you're always going to get work and you're always going to be able to have a job uh in terms of like a writer like me uh you know uh and and actors you know it's it's, it's harder if you get uh if you get canceled in that way you know uh yeah i don't i don't know what the answer would be then. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, when you're looking at what's going on um, in comedy today, especially with the younger people and the younger comedians and writers, um, you know, what are you seeing? Like, what are you seeing is, is, are the trends that are, are interesting, that are encouraging or discouraging? Do you, do you feel like there is something new 
emerging out of all the political chaos and social chaos in, in the US and around the world today? Or um, is it just kind of repackaging things that are that have always been kind of the same and, and just giving it a, a different um, a different vehicle? I think a lot of younger comedians are, aren't agreeing with a lot of the, the direction that uh, social media and society is trying to push comedy in. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think they're figuring out different ways of being funny. Um, and, and it's definitely, you know, I mean, I think, I think it's, I, I think ultimately it's, it's good what's happening because you know, we're not going to just rely on shock humor, you know, and um, the rules have always been good for comedy uh, because you have to be more creative and work your way around them for any art, really. You know, once Howard Stern uh, went from uh, terrestrial radio to, you know, whatever he's on now, um and he has all that freedom he i lost interest in him you know mm -hmm. i liked his way of getting around the the rules of censorship right you know? right it gives it the it gives it the edge like if you're not yeah. if, you, if you're not going up against something then who cares it, it's sort of yeah good job for yeah, you definitely. Say right. yeah. yeah he's yeah he's he's not the once again he's not the underdog anymore right yeah. right so um, what are you doing now? What are you working on? Where, where's your mind in terms of your own, your own work and writing and comedy? Uh, in terms of comedy, I'm uh, writing a, uh, a pilot for Fox. It's a, an animated show. Um, cool. It's just in its writing stage, so it's not picked up yet. Um, and uh, so it's an interesting process because this is like, you know, Fox, it's 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 a network. I've I've never had much success on my own writing for a, a network, you know, for my own show. Uh, so it's an interesting process. We'll see if it works out. Um, and you know, uh, just my pure comedy sense comes out more in, you know, I do a podcast uh, with a with a bunch of friends, and hardly anyone listens to it, which is uh, comforting to me <laughs> and I get to do whatever I want and get to, you know, and, and feel like I have the freedom to, to, to say whatever I want and just have fun. And, um, I think, uh, you know, in contrast to what I was saying before with the idea of censorship, also just having a freedom and, and not being afraid, uh, definitely, uh, lends itself to comedy. So, mm -hmm. um, but other than that, you know, artistically, I'm, I'm, I, I have a band and I'm writing songs and, uh, and, and recording them. And, uh, you know, I'm not a very good singer and I'm an okay guitarist, but uh, it, it's, it's a passion of mine right now. And I think a lot of the songs have, have a little humor in them too. Yeah, um, very cool. Well, you, like I was saying, you know, it feels like a very interesting time for comedy, not just because of the politics, but also because comedy feels to really have become a, a central to the culture. I mean, I think of some even like really dramatic TV series that are out there today, like Billions or Succession. And I know, you know, Billions, um, at, at least from uh, Brian Koppelman standpoint, he's a, he's a huge comedy fan, huge SNL fan. And you see it, you see the comedy come out in these heavy dr drama series. Um, you see that they're even willing to to like get a little slapsticky in these moments uh, in both those shows I mentioned, which is really kind of different and pretty cool actually. To, that they're letting the show breathe in that way and be and like suddenly bursting into this like just absolutely pure comedy. Some of it just physical comedy, and I think that's kind of a product of comedy taking center stage in the culture and becoming so important in a way that I've never seen it before in my lifetime as an adult, it was always something that was there, obviously, but now it really feels like we are negotiating public life partly through comedy. That's interesting. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen those shows. I don't really watch a lot of uh, uh, TV series uh, of any kind, but I'm interested in what you're saying. I, is the comedy 
something that comes out of character? Um, does it make sense or does it seem like it's coming out of nowhere and is almost surreal? In those um, it, definitely in succession, it's 100% character driven. I mean, it, this, the characters are, it, they're in, in this absurd world of wealth and power. And they have, you know, back to our earlier point about no rules, they have no rules. There's no one, they're, there's, they're so powerful and wealthy that they can say and act however they want. And you see what right. happens when people are living like that. It's, it's insane. And, yeah, it, yeah. and it works. Like, it's like, you could see how people like living like that would actually act and behave in these ways. And it's, it's well, funny. That's, that's good to hear, you know, because I think it's very important to keep the integrity of the character and the situation, you know, mm -hmm. that's what's the funniest, you know, to me. Yeah. I, I, I've recently, um, you know, I, I, I watched Curb Your Enthusiasm when it first came out and, um, and I, and I kind of lost interest and then, and then I gained interest again recently watching it on YouTube. And I realized why, because the character and the moments are amazing, you know, and it's what you're talking about. It's a, it's a guy with so much power that he can do whatever he wants, basically. <laughs> but when I, then I'd go, okay, I want to watch this whole episode instead of these scenes on YouTube. And I'd watch the whole episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm. And they, they almost got surreal in a way that I couldn't believe, you know, mm -hmm. like yeah. all these situations would dovetail together in unbelievable right. ways. Right. And uh, I felt like the, the whole was lesser than the parts mm. of that show. And I, and so I just went back to watching just the bits on YouTube. Yeah. You know, I actually went back um, to watch the very, I think it was, I think it was the first episode. I'm not sure. It was really one of the first few. Um, yeah. And uh, Bob Odenkirk was, on, on the show and playing this, playing a porn star. And it was so raunchy. I couldn't believe I was watching the same show that we see today. It was like the guy just really, uh, Larry David, obviously just and the writers took the gloves off in that episode. And you're just like, whoa, is this the Seinfeld creator that I'm, that I'm familiar yeah. with? And then it changed. And then it really became a lot more uh, what we see today which you know maybe is a natural thing but it that moment was like i was a bit shocked yeah it really ha has it's it's got the structure of a sitcom you know but mm -hmm. the, the right. feel of a uh, cassavetes movie almost something <laughs> right so um any other thoughts parting thoughts for us about comedy about about writing um you know i think i think something that people think about a lot it, with regard to comedy writing, TV writing, film writing, and any in creative endeavor in general is how to start. And I think that's where people uh, d sort of, they look at this thing, they're just like, this. it's impossible. Like, I'll never be able to do that. It's a dream. I'd love it. It's a fantasy. And what gets them caught up is just the first step, uh, the first move, the first success. That's, yeah, I guess it, it's, don't think about success. The, mm. um, Think about what you love doing and do it and surround yourself by people who love doing similar things and work right. with them and you'll help each other uh, in just doing it and also once jobs start coming up you know that's what happened to me you know it was like I I built a network of people without even thinking about what a network of people Right. Would that who would give me jobs were it just happened naturally because I loved doing it and I had a passion for it and I just followed that passion. Yeah, yeah that's um, that's something that Brian Eno talked about. He he coined the term "senius," like the genius of being in a scene, because mm -hmm. you have the energy, you have the relationships. Um, and the, those compound, like it's not, it's not one-to-one, -one. like you, you have two relationships. It's like having, like what they say about P STDs. It's like, you're not sleeping with two people, you're sleeping with 20. It's the same thing, I think, with, with um, making progress in any field, but especially in the arts and any kind of creative endeavor, because it really depends on that ability to collaborate and that ability to um, ha have all boats rise. And I think that's a really important thing. And I think the other thing that's really important there is that the hardest suffering for a lot of people in creative endeavors is feeling alone, is feeling yeah. that nobody cares, no one's ever going to give a shit, this is pointless, and they end up hating themselves on account of it. And if you can like, 
you, you, you make the problem into its, a solu into its own solution by working with others, by collaborating, by creating a community of your own kind. Definitely, definitely. And it's, uh, you know, if I could take his Eno's term and alter it, I'd say glenius. You, you're, you're mm. genius of following your glee, you know. Right, right. I had, I had to think of a, a E sound. So glee. <laughs> That's good. Go, uh, go buy that uh, URL after the. <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, sure Eno's got them all now. <laughs> all the E sounds of. So, um, so I, I wanted to thank you for taking the time. Uh, this has been really interesting. And, I, you know, I think, again, I think this is just something people are just naturally drawn to comedy in and of itself. But I think they're drawn to the to the question of comedy, especially as we're seeing it today. So this is great to hear from from somebody like you who's been in the business for, for as long as you have and done what you've done. So um, thank you. And you know, if there are any parting thoughts? Um, a, a great question I like to ask people, I guess, is what you're reading, um, if anything. Uh, yeah, I'm not actually reading anything right now. The the last thing I read was uh, that I really enjoyed was Lincoln and the Bardo, oh, yeah. um, and it's just a, a beautiful story. If uh, if you get a chance, I have you read it? Uh, I have not read it. I have read. Um, Sanders um, stories. He can't, yeah. you know, he had that really famous um, collection of stories that was that just yeah. bonkers. But um, I will check it out. I've heard it's an incredible book, and he's uh, an amazing writer, of course. It's 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 very uh, heartbreaking and funny at the same time. And uh, yeah, I think uh, ever, it's all, and it's almost like reading a script in a way. So very cool. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Dino Stamatopoulos, thank you so much for joining us on the Burning Castle podcast. Uh, where can people find you if they want to like look you up and or possibly engage with what you're doing? Where should they go? Uh, it's tough. You got to first learn how to spell my name <laughs> and then look for me on, uh, you know, uh, Instagram or something. Uh, that's a, yeah, I don't even know how to get onto my podcast and I don't promote it at all uh uh but uh we'll, do some, actually, we'll do some research on our end we'll, we'll we'll dig out the podcast wherever it might be and uh we'll link to it yeah yeah unless you, you don't want. want us to we don't have to we can i don't really it. care do whatever you want <laughs> <All right. laughs> thanks ashley thank you Dino. Bye -bye.